those of you who are here for Stacy Schiff, I want to say that I'm terribly sorry for the delay. We're running a bit late, but Stacy Schiff is our next uh, author to come up. And so those of you that are waiting, um, have been waiting for John Meacham, we are, we are running a little late. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon. We're running a bit late. Our next session, our ne next author is Stacy Schiff. So for those of you that are waiting for John Meacham, we still have another author ahead of him. Uh, but most of you, I believe, are here to see our next author. And I want to welcome you to the 32, 32nd Annual Miami Book Fair, hosted and presented to you by Miami-Dade College. My name is Julie Alexander, and I'm your room host for this afternoon. And without further ado, we really appreciate your patience, but without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Clydette, Clydette de Root. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I just want you to know that she will be signing books very quickly outside after her presentation because she has a flight to catch. So go fast and she'll sign fast. So it is, it is a great pleasure to introduce Stacy Schiff. Since her first book was published some years ago, I loved that book and I think I've devoured every one that she's written since then. She is the author of Vera winner of the Pulitzer Prize. She's also the author of Cleopatra, A Life, a best-selling book and winner of the Penn Jacqueline Bograd Weld Award for Biography. She's the author of Saint Exupéry, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and a great improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America, winner of the George Washington Book Prize and the Ambassador Book Award. Stacy Schiff received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, and an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her latest book, Witches of Salem, Witches, The Witches, Salem 1692, unpacks the mystery of the Salem witch trials, which began in 1692 when a minister's daughter began to scream and convulse. It ended less than a year later, but not before 19 men and women had been hanged and an elderly man crushed to death. The panic spread quickly, involving the most educated men and prominent politicians in the colony. In curious ways, the trials would shape the future republic. As psychologically thrilling as it is historical, historically seminal, The Witches is Stacy Schiff's account of this fantastical story. Please join me in welcoming Stacy Schiff. Thank you all. Don't worry about the signing. I'm a very slow writer, but I'm a really fast signer, so I'll get to everybody. Um, just after I started writing this book, I, uh, working on this book, I went to see one of the great uh, 17th century experts, someone who I thought had written the best pages we have on Salem, because I wanted some advice about the archives. And when I left that afternoon, he, um, as, a last, as an afterthought, offered another little piece of advice. I should probably warn you, he said, that strange things tend to happen to you when you work on witchcraft. Um, it was a fall day, it was a crisp day, I walked off, I, researched and wrote the book. I delivered it more or less on schedule. Um, the publisher was pleased with it. They were even more pleased when they discovered that Publishers Weekly, the book industry publication, was going to be doing a feature on me this fall. And with it, they would include a full page, full bleed photo, which indeed they did, and it looked like this. <laughs> as, you, as you might notice, that Stacy Schiff is not I. <laughs> Thanks to Twitter, it, it took about 90 seconds to learn that that Stacey Schiff is the novelist Amy Stewart. Um, she has a book out this fall, which I will also be signing after this talk. <laughs> when I asked my publisher to send this over so that I could show it to you, um, I also asked for an image of the magazine's table of contents, which I hadn't yet seen, and they did send it, and here it is. It announces my turn to fiction in my forthcoming novel. <laughs> You can imagine my surprise at learning that the four years that I'd spent in the archives unearthing and deciphering and squinting at and citing from documents, corralling 
my imagination and triple-checking details was also that I could write a novel. <laughs> Indeed, strange things happen to you when you work on witchcraft. The Witches is not a work of fiction. It's instead an attempt to grapple with precisely what happened in Eastern Massachusetts in 1692 among the more disturbing moments in our history. It may qualify as the best known, least understood chapter in America's past, partly because it seems so improbable, partly because it comes to us largely through Hawthorne and Arthur Miller who were writing fiction, and partly because New England's enemies seem to have made off with the story. Here we are, about halfway between Plymouth Rock and Paul Revere, and all seems to go entirely off the rails. Salem offers several kinds of stories at once, as I'll make clear in a few minutes, but all of that in really nine short months. It's a tragedy to which we regularly return. A few corners of American history have been, so explore, have, have been so often explored, and if you don't believe me, take a look at this. This is my local library's shelves on 17th century America. Um, here by my, the way, these are my office shelves when I finish the book. Um, you'll notice those little volumes at the top, those green and red volumes, those, those are the Loeb Classical Library refugees from the Cleopatra years. Um, and only recently did I look up and wonder what Cicero must think to be surrounded on all sides by Puritans. <laughs> Salem's a little bit our, our national campfire tale, one of the rare moments in our history when the candles are knocked out and everyone seems to be groping around in the dark. That's the place where all good stories begin. In the dark, we believe most fervently and, Im and imagine most vividly. In the dark, we contemplate our mistakes and wrestle with our fears. In the dark, goes the Italian proverb, every cat is a leopard. And if you read the court papers of 17th century Essex County, you begin to notice that the New Englander lived very much, very anxiously, and very attentively in the dark. Women stumble into beds to find strangers sleeping there. Men trip home through the night to discover that familiar landmarks have moved and that they're lost in their own backyards. Young men report that they are weak need at the thought of riding from town to their family farms after sundown. And when the devil offers to accompany them, they accept his offer. In a dark barn, the candle knocked from her hand, a teenage girl informs a man who attempts to assault her, and I quote, I would rather be gored by the cows than defiled by such a rogue as you. I read every 17th century account of the New England murk of the howling wolves and the lurking Native Americans, but it took me a very long time to realize how dark, dark truly can be. I, our world is utterly electrified. Their world is palpably, physically black. And in fact, it took me until this. This is downtown Manhattan in 2012 in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. I was driving friends home um, when the power was out and I turned off the headlights and suddenly all of those accounts um, of the New England wilderness suddenly made sense to me. The 17th century dark was a very different dark, hence the line in chapter one, the sky over New England was crow black, pitch bat black, Bible black, so black it could be difficult at night to keep to the path, so black that a line of trees might find, uh, might freely migrate to another location, or that you might find yourself pursued after nightfall by a rabid black hog, leaving you to crawl home bloody and disoriented on all fours. I should mention too that in court testimony, the early American often mentioned that he'd been an ear witness to something. Words and sound reigned supreme. It was really, really quiet. And that testimony, by the way, about the rabid black hog um, is from a September witch trial. The hog, swore a 40-year-old farmer, was no hog at all, it was a devil. Um, it had caused him to trip, slashing his leg with his knife, and he knew who it was. It was a witch, he swore, um, and he could identify her. She was the woman who had come into the tavern where he was drinking with a friend a few nights earlier and told the friend that he shouldn't have been out quite so late. Um, the, woman the woman hanged for witchcraft two weeks after that testimony. The basic Salem facts are simple. In early 1692, over a particularly harsh winter, a nine and an 11-year-old girl began to shudder and scream. They happened to have been the niece and the daughter of Salem Village Minister Samuel Paris. Um, this is he just probably just before the move to Salem when he would have been in his late 30s. The cousins complained 
that something bit and choked them. They, their bodies twisted. They attempted to fly through the air. They lunged into fireplaces. One of them disappeared halfway down a well. We have a number of descriptions of their symptoms, but obviously we have no image. This is really the closest that we can come. This is from a 19th century French text on the phases of hysteria or on emotional trauma and its physical manifestations. Those arched backs and the pretzeled limbs, um, the rigid limbs are very much what people who observed the, the Paris girls um, described. Remember that no one in the 17th century distinguished between an overtaxed nervous system and bewitchment. Within a matter of weeks, two other village girls began to convulse. All of them soon learned from Samuel Paris and from other authorities that they were bewitched. And with that diagnosis, you can very well guess what happened. Their, system, their symptoms begin to deteriorate. Soon enough, all four of them revealed who bewitched them. We don't know why they named the names they did, but think about it for a second. To the question, who annoys you, who unsettles you, who irritates you, we all have an answer. <laughs> and so did the girls. About a month or so ago, my credit card was hacked. And when I called American Express to report it, um, the first question was, did you lend your card to anyone? And the second question was, do you know anyone who might have done this to you? <laughs> and all I could think was, I know that question. <laughs> it turned out that there were not one but three witches flying around Salem Village. Warrants went out at the end of February for their arrests. The suspects appeared immediately before the authorities, who interrogated them in the manner of the day, which is to say that a local beggar woman, the first woman to be deposed, was asked when she'd signed a contract with the devil, why she hurt the girls, and what creatures she had dispatched in order to do so. Those questions came to her from important, well-dressed men who lived in stately homes and owned significant businesses who spoke with weight and authority. In other words, the contest was asymmetric. I should say that the story has something for everyone, and here it begins to mutate. If it started as a fairy tale, once upon a time, a wicked witch cast a spell on two little girls, it turns soon enough into a courtroom drama. Let me talk for just a few minutes about witchcraft um, and how it worked. Um, not every 17th century New Englander was clear on the subject, but those who were, were exceedingly clear. To the early American, a witch existed as plainly as did heat or light. As one authority had it, it was as obvious that a spirit could convey men and women through the air as it was that the wind could flatten a house. The early American witch, I should add, did not look like this. <laughs> Although there is a great deal of the Wizard of Oz in this story about which more in a minute. And, and nor did the 17th century witch look like this. This is actually the original Wicked Witch of the West from the 1900 edition of the Wizard of Oz. Um, I'm particularly partial to that flying braid and the um, entirely unexpected spats. This is an early American Halloween witch. Witches came late to that holiday. We really don't even know how they were involved with Halloween in the first place. But when, fi when first they appeared, they dressed very colorfully. They seemed to have reverted to basic black only after Margaret Hamilton in the 1939 movie. The witch as a 17th century New Englander knew her was someone who performed unnatural feats by virtue of her contract with the devil. And from that pact, she drew the power to transform herself into cats, into wolves, into rabbits, and of course, into rabid black hogs. A witch could be a man or a woman, though more often she was female. And she maintained a menagerie of imps or familiars, demonic mascots that did her bidding. They were often turtles or weasels. Cats, dogs, and toads were prevalent. As you can see here, this 17th century woman is purportedly feeding her blood to her diabolical toads. This is a woman with her great black cat and her demon familiar. She actually illustrates a 1621 English witchcraft case. And, and this woman was acquitted of all charges. These are more diabolical familiars. You'll see that they range from really your basic standard issue barnyard animal to fantastical gargoyle-like creatures. Black cats uh, were particular favorites. They turn up regularly throughout the Salem testimony. Black dogs recur in the Salem record too, but historically English witches tended to prefer feline to canine form. Um, this, by the way, is not a witch's familiar. This is our family cat. Um, <laughs> looking, I hope, ever so vaguely demonic here. 
a witch could be a muttering, muttering contentious malcontent, or she or he could be inexplicably strong or unaccountably smart. Both kinds of witches would turn up in Salem, as would wealthy merchants who were witches, sea captains who were witches, ministers, and homeless five-year-old girls who were witches. Witchcraft tended to run in families along matrilineal lines. There would be a reason why so many of the accused were either related or related to earlier witchcraft suspects, or both. While her power was supernatural, the witch's crime was religious. In New England, her ultimate target was the soul rather than the body. And her connection to those convulsing girls in Salem? Every Englishman had long known what enchantment looked like. According to the legal guide on many Salem desks, and which was about to land on Samuel Parris's desk, this is the volume by Puritan theologian William Perkins, witchcraft manifested as senseless trances, paralyzed limbs, convulsions, jaws clamped shut, frothing, gnashing, and violent shaking. In other words, the symptoms of the girls in the parsonage to a T. Among the abundant proofs of a witch's existence was the biblical injunction against her, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, commands scripture. I'm sorry to have to share with you the basic English translation of Exodus 22:18. Any woman using unnatural powers or secret arts is to be put to death. That pretty much applies to every woman I know. <laughs> when Massachusetts established a legal code, the first capital crime was idolatry. The second was witchcraft. In the years since those laws had been codified, New England had indicted about 100 witches, a quarter of them men, but, the, but Massachusetts had hanged only six. Beside the mystery of the Salem village symptoms, there is the arguably greater mystery, why in 1692 the hasty and merciless prosecution. The charges were familiar from earlier cases. Casting spells on livestock was a fairly common one. In Salem, witches cast spells on cattle, on hay, on wagons and muskets. They enchanted fireplaces and they sent dishes sailing. This woodcut is from an early English case. These accused women did not fare well. They, um, why, you might ask, are they riding a pig because they had been accused of pig bewitching? New England witches uh, do a great deal of flying down chimneys and through apple trees and ultimately to a diabolical Sabbath. But traditionally, the English witch did not fly. Continental witches, however, did, which will provide a significant clue as to what happens in Salem in 1692. Nor had there been any ghosts which will begin to flit around the courtroom in Salem. Most, but not all of them, are women who've come back from the dead to avenge themselves on abusive husbands. Those who confess to witchcraft will mention having flown, I should add, on the devil's shoulders or on poles or branches or sticks. No New England witch will ever fly on a broom. These are some English flyers. No, those are not English flyers. There are some English flyers. They seem to be recruiting the women on the ground. Um, this woodcut comes later. It's probably 18th century. Um, and as far as broomsticks go, uh, this one is my favorite. Leave it to a French woman to fly gracefully. <laughs> These are 15th century French broomsticks. The accepted logic on the phenomenon went like this. Which has existed in all times and places? How was it possible that imagination, which was so personal and unpredictable, could deliver the same conceit across cultures in all eras? In other words, Witchcraft was so preposterous, so improbable, it had to be true. You couldn't make this stuff up. To the impossibility of a shared delusion was added the most compelling reason to believe in witchcraft. Not to subscribe to it was heresy. Sober minds did not make sport of the invisible world, especially in light of the evidence, noted Cotton Mather, the young, influential Boston minister at the center of the crisis. Without mystery, there is no faith. To deny witchcraft was to deny religion, a small step from a more provocative assertion. To deny witchcraft was to advocate it. The first arrests surprised no one. Um, the three suspects counted among the, unlikeliest, the, among the likeliest people to be voted off the island. But let me just talk for a few seconds about the next one, about the fourth accused witch, for a few reasons. I think, I think part of what fascinates us about 1692 is the seeming randomness of the accusations. What if the next knock were to land on your door? And in the case of Martha Coria, very pious, stiff-spined farm woman in her 60s, we know precisely what happened 
when that knock came about mid-afternoon on March 12th. Her name, first uttered by a 12-year-old village girl, surprised everyone. Because it did, Corey's church deacon and another villager paid a call on her as a kind of courtesy. First, they stopped off to see the accusing girl. Could she possibly be mistaken? Could she describe the clothes that her tormentor wore? The girl could not, because she explained the witch had also that morning blinded her temporarily. The men rode off. They found Martha Corey at home. She welcomed them with a smile. She also anticipated their question. I know what you are come for. You are come to talk with me about being a witch, she said. She was not a witch. She couldn't stop her neighbors from, from gossiping. How do we know all of this, by the way? Because the two men later wrote out a detailed deposition. I'm showing this to you so you'll feel sorry for me. This is vintage 17th century handwriting. <laughs> when her callers revealed that a bewitched girl had named her, Martha Corey was prepared. But does she tell you what clothes I have on, she asked. The two men were flabbergasted by the question. She seemed to have some kind of supernatural knowledge. And so they asked her to repeat it. She assured them she had no cause for concern. Everyone knew how devout she was. She was a little bit doctrinaire and given to lecturing. She was not surprised if the devil had recruited the first three women accused. In her estimation, they were idle, slothful people. A remarkable thing I should say about Salem is that even those who believe themselves to be innocent think the other, the other accused witches to be guilty. That afternoon, Martha Corey promised to open the eyes of the magistrates and ministers so they might locate the real witches, another comment that would backfire. Within the week, not only her 12-year-old accuser, but the girl's mother was also afflicted. A spectral Corey near, nearly tore the older woman to shreds, offering her a diabolical pact to sign. The warrant for Corey's arrest went out immediately. This is it. She stood accused of having committed sundry acts of witchcraft on a grown woman and on four youngsters, one of them Samuel Paris's 12-year-old niece. That note in black at the bottom is the Salem constable's confirmation that he's arrested Corey and that she's in custody. But this document is dated March 19th, which was a Saturday. Because of the Sabbath the next day, she couldn't be immediately apprehended. And that left her time to attend meeting alongside her accusers. So before the pulpit that Sunday, you have five spellbound girls and women and a witch suspect. They all stood in close proximity in a 24 by 38 foot building. Here's a reconstruction of the village meeting house. You can get an idea from how small those windows are, by how dark it was inside. Often suspects had to be taken outside to be properly identified. The minister began the service he was interrupted by writhing in the pews. The girls demanded that he name his text. They complained that it was too long. One pointed to the ceiling. She could see Martha Corey sitting not in the pews, but on the beam above, nursing a diabolical canary. The next day, Corey returned to the same room to defend herself. It was thronged with spectators. There was a palpable terror in the small space, the kind we tend to feel around contagion. A minister in the room said he could nearly make out the hammering hearts and the raised hairs on the backs of necks. She insisted before the authorities on her innocence. She appealed to the Lord to open the eyes of the magistrates. They did not appreciate the implication that they were not already clear-sighted. One asked the question that gnawed on everyone's mind, how had she known she would be asked about her clothing? She tried to explain, but she was interrupted. The girls frantically pointed out the devil in the room, whispering in Martha Corey's ear. What did he say to you, asked the justice. She said she had neither seen nor heard a thing. He urged her to confess. She would not. One of the oddities I should also mention about 1692 is that those who refuse to confess will hang, while those who confess will be spared, um, which is to say that the most principled and the noblest fare the least well. Corey was pelted with questions, none of which she could answer. She would not concede that the girls were bewitched, although, as one of the justices reminded her, everyone else around her believed that they were. Instead, she posed a particularly plaintive question herself. Can an innocent person, she asked, be guilty? You can't read this, but this is the account of her deposition, and the magistrate's first lines are, you are now in the hands of authority. Tell me now why you hurt these persons. And she replies, I do not, um, and asks if she, can, if she can pray. She asks three times, and three times the, re the request is denied. She insisted she had nothing to do with witchcraft. 
a statement that incensed the crowd. The girls began to yelp and to snap and mock her replies. When she bit her lip with nervousness, teeth marks bloomed on the arms of her accusers. It seemed that she worked her, her witchcraft before the court's eyes. By this time, two adult women were bewitched, and in the course of Corey's testimony, one of them, a 40-year-old, began to howl in pain. She could feel Martha Corey reaching deep into her body to hurt her, and she threw her muff across the courtroom at Corey. It failed to hit her, so the woman leaned down to take off one of her shoes, which she then threw, hitting Corey squarely in the head. A pin that she had stuck in one of her victims turned up in a child in, the, in a child's hair. Here, by the way, are some pins purportedly preserved from the Salem courtroom. Over the next weeks, they would protrude from girls' legs and from hands. One girl would turn up with a pin puncturing her lips together, um, binding them together so that she couldn't testify. How do we know all of this? From two sources. A former village minister was on hand that day, and he published his wide-eyed account of the, of the infestation in April. This is the title page. You can imagine it did nothing to alleviate symptoms. And we have a lot of the paperwork from the hearing. Um, this is the dep deposition of one of Martha Corey's accusers, a 17-year-old named Elizabeth Hubbard. It seemed that Martha Corey had urged her to sign a pact with the devil. She'd bitten and choked and pinched her, the girl displayed her bruises. I believe in my heart that Martha Corey is a dreadful witch, the teenager swears, words that, as you can see from the ink, were added later. The court testimony is not infrequently edited or expanded upon um, after the fact. This is a Samuel Paris deposition um, against Martha Corey, and you can see in the second and third lines he's added the local innkeeper later after he's already written out the account. Corey went to jail that day. She would spend the next six months in chains awaiting trial. Six days after her hearing, her minister delivered this sermon, also in the meeting house. This is a March 27th sermon titled, Christ Knows How Many Devils There Are in His Churches and Who They Are. And it begins, occasioned by dreadful witchcraft, broke out here a few weeks past, and one member of this church, that's Corey, and another of Salem, upon public examination, by civil authority vehemently suspected for she-witches and upon it committed. It's a finger-pointing sermon in which Paris stakes out a position that would solidify in the weeks to come. We are either saints or devils, he preaches. The Bible offers no middle ground. You can imagine what happened next. People remembered things they couldn't explain, often decades-old things they couldn't explain. Men began to see neighbors flying through the streets, one man swore that his neighbor whipped past him swift as a bird. Another wrestled with a black goblin in his parlor. Again and again, while working on this book, I thought of Dumbledore in the seventh Harry Potter book. Of course it's happening inside your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean it's not real? Fingers pointed right and left. Sixty people were soon jailed. The first case came to trial in June, and the first suspect hanged a week later, protesting her innocence to the end. Events moved quickly. Arrests and afflictions multiplied. It was a plague involving 100 witches, a number that grew to 307 and later to 500. And here's where the courtroom drama mutates yet again, now into a horror story, not only for those who spent months roasting and starving in airless, filthy prisons, Several suspects would die there, others would give birth there. But what begins to emerge from the testimony are details of a diabolical plot. It seems that the witches have a ringleader. He's a minister who's arrested in May. And they're intent on a rather grandiose conspiracy. Beginning with Salem Village, the witches intend to destroy every church in Massachusetts Bay. And while they're at it, they intend to subvert the government, too. Hints of this turn up throughout the early summer, but not until the epidemic has spread to Andover, the town with the greatest number of witches, did the full story emerge. By late July, the authorities had pieced together the tale of this diabolical Sabbath, to which witches flew from all over by various forms of conveyance, often three or four to a pole, to land in Salem Village. Again, you can reconstruct this from 50-odd testimonies, but we have no image. Um, here instead is a 17th century engraving of a German witch's Sabbath. It's a more decadent production, um, but certain themes are familiar to what the Salem confessors will mention. Uh, men and women fly to a clearing. Winged lions and goblins join them. A woman tumbles from her mount 
just as an Andover woman would crash on her pole as she flew to Salem. You remember that I said that there had been no flying in Massachusetts before 1692? Well, suddenly, everyone is aloft. Here's an illustration of 22 years earlier from a Swedish witchcraft epidemic. And from the book, you'll see why Sweden is essential to what will happen in Salem. Um, notice that this woman flies with her children. In Massachusetts, um, girls of eight or nine accused mothers of coercing them to sign packs with the devil. And indeed, by late summer, denunciations fly in every direction. Daughters accuse mothers, brothers accuse sisters, parishioners accuse ministers. In Andover, nearly one in 10 people was accused. Servants accused mistresses, although mistresses did not accuse servants. Wives did not incriminate husbands. And generally, I should add, women tend to come off somewhat better in this story. Um, as a group, it was young men who provided the most outlandish testimony. But no one ever suffered afflictions without being able to name a witch. Martha Corey went to her death on September 22nd in what would be the last hanging. Before she, hung, before she hanged, she was visited in prison by Reverend Paris, who excommunicated her. This is his account of that conversation. He's irritated that the condemned prisoner, you'll remember that she was a very devout woman, refuses to pray with him. In the 17th century, a prisoner paid for his own hay and blankets and provisions. This is an accounting from the Salem jail keep, and the third entry here is for Martha Corey and her husband. By September, the colony had executed 14 women, five men, and two dogs for witchcraft. Somewhere between 140 and 180 people had been accused. And then, as abruptly as it had begun, the panic was over. The questions that Salem elicits are those of our nightmares. Can an innocent person be guilty, Martha Corey had asked. Might I be a witch and not know it, inquired another suspect. Could anyone, wondered a group of men, late in the summer, think himself safe? A brash widow in her 50s came before the justices in April. She was not a witch. She couldn't even say what a witch was. She had the bad luck to be appearing before a fine logician. How can you know that you're not a witch and yet not know what a witch is, countered the justice. You see that this story is one part Faust, one part the Brothers Grimm, and one part Kafka. So obviously what we have on our hands is not entirely a fairy tale or a courtroom drama or a horror story but a thriller. Presumably there were no flights through the air or killer cats. Presumably no witch stuck pins in the girls. Presumably there was no satanic celebration with tankards and sacred bread in the meadow. How then did these things seem to happen? When you pry the whole episode apart, you begin to say that it may, see that it makes eminently modern an uncanny sense. The clues to what drives Salem forward, what makes grown men see goblins in their parlors, what results in an unprecedented 100% conviction rate and the only witchcraft panic in American history, are woven a strand at a time into each chapter of the book, and they're revealed entirely on the last pages. The story is a thriller, and the book is meant to read like one. It's meant to unspool with the logic of a dream and the lucidity of the supernatural. The unlikeliest of heroes will ultimately emerge. We go back to Salem again and again for the same reason that it came to pass in the first place, that irksome lack of closure. We share the villagers' need for resolution. But we go back to the trials for another reason, too. We are helplessly drawn to disasters. And as crack-ups go, this one counts among the more sensational in American history, to which so many later missteps would be compared. That's less on account of the scale than on account of the circumstances. The 1692 witchcraft court consisted of the best and the brightest. That year it was the state in the broad light of day in the name of God, led by the ablest men in the colony who sent innocent people to their deaths. When friends and acquaintances came before the authorities, the authorities doubted not the girls, but their longtime friends. This is Chief Justice William Stoughton who headed the court. Um, I'll give you a hint and tell you that he's not the hero of the story. He's every bit as starchy as he looked here. He was the most eminent of New England legal authorities. He also died at home nine years after the trials without a word of regret or apology. Few men in 17th century Massachusetts knew legal code, as well as did Stoughton, which points up something else crucial about the panic. 
erudition will play much more of a role than ignorance did here. The Bay Colony arguably qualified as the best educated community in the history of the world until that time. The New England ministers, especially Increase in Cotton Mather, the father and son to whom any number of the civic authorities appealed for guidance, had delved deeply into the literature. They had devoured libraries on the subject of witchcraft. If anything, they may have read too much. They knew of English prosecutions. They knew of continental variations. They knew what the skeptics had argued. They knew what a Swedish witch's Sabbath looked like. Let me make clear while this, that while this was a truly deranged moment in our history, um, it was also a profoundly significant one. When the spell breaks, the recriminations sweep away a rich layer of faith. The very idea of confession, central to Puritanism, would be tainted. Massachusetts leaders would never again apply to the church for advice. Its complicity in 1692 cracks open the door to religious toleration, and the trials would change the way the country saw New England as well as the way New England saw itself. No one did more to keep them alive than the South, which later would shame New England with its witch prosecuting whenever New England wanted to talk about slave owning. Today, of course, the trials endure as a sort of moral guardrail. This is where Salem mutates yet again to become a cautionary tale. They stop us whenever we overreact or overcorrect, when fear overpowers reason. They make the experts seem less expert. They remind us of the risk of thinking ourselves exceptional. Where will the devil show most malice, but where he's hated and hated most, Cotton Mather had asked. Satan's appearance in Massachusetts seemed nearly to be a badge of honor, further proof that New Englanders qualified as the chosen people. I just want to add that Salem feels to me deeply and eerily familiar in an age of crowdsourced stories and public shaming. An oral culture bears a remarkable resemblance to an internet one, both feed on rumor, neither has much use for truth. The internet turns out to be a brilliant tool for sowing mass hysteria. There is no better way to broadcast a zombie apocalypse. The vir that virality was something I didn't see at the outset, nor did I see how much politics informs this story or how much class has to do with it. At its heart, Salem too resembles a fairy tale. It has sexual undercurrents and raw terror. It features flying monkeys and village tailors, enchanted apples and evil stepmothers. It's about what happens when for 23 years you've been dying to tell a neighbor what you think of her, but find that as a good Christian woman you just can't. In 1692 you suddenly could. It's about what we see when we close our eyes and about how those images evolve. Sometimes they mutate from this into that. It touches on what's unreal but by no means untrue. And like a fairy tale, it's a story of women, or in which women play the starring, starring roles, but one written by men. Strange things indeed happen when you start to write about witchcraft, but strange things happen anyway. And often our efforts to make sense of them lead us astray into what Poe called the wilderness of error. This is my wilderness. This is one of the five file drawers of Salem material. I suppose what I hope you take from the book is a reminder of how the importance of, of humility and of how easily the moral can skid into the sanctimonious. It's essential we keep our heads, even if we, that we question our ideas, even, that, even if that leaves us bewildered. It's an uncomfortable state, but as a later sometime Bostonian noted, bewilderment is crucial and we'd be lost without it. It seems probable, wrote Henry James, almost exactly 200, 200 years after the trials, that if we were never bewildered, there would never be a story to tell about us. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for some quick questions, um, comments, corrections. Thank you so much. I uh, heard you in a Barnes & Noble um, interview mention that 1692 was just removed from all of the public records, from diaries, um, from all different sources. So were these just torn out? Was it visible that they were like ripped from the, the pages? Or, or how, how, 
What did this look like visibly? It's, 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 it's a great question. The church record book, 1692, goes missing in this way that leads one to become conspiracy-minded oneself. Not that that would happen to any old historian or anything. Um, the church record book is rewritten. It's not the first time that the Salem Village church record book would be rewritten to cover up embar an embarrassing history. Um, a, min a, published minister's, a minister's published sermons with Samuel Will Willard in Boston simply skips from over the summer of 1692 as if he never delivered a sermon that summer. Diaries that we have only in typescript, 1692 just has gone missing. Um, Samuel Paris did not record the deaths of people who hanged. He only recorded people who died of natural causes or of in Indian incidents that summer. Um, so it's very, and, th and the trial papers, I should add, have disappeared, although that happened later. And again, we don't know the circumstances of it. So, you know, there is this strange conspiracy of silences. There is, a, there is clearly a blanket of shame that falls on the entire episode. Um, and that's clear from some of the recriminations and the infighting afterwards. But it's hard to say there was an orchestrated attempt um, at remaining silent about this and hoping that you could erase history. It's clearly an event that no one's comfortable speaking about until several generations after it happened. Thank you. Hi, it was a very wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank um, you. Wanted to ask quickly, was there any thought ever given to organic causes, things like tetanus, because you mentioned the nails, or you know, causing seizures, or possibly even a hallucinogenic agents like wheat growing um, LSD? Yeah. It sounds like everyone's tripping, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, those theories have been put forth. The, the, the fungal LSD idea, ergot theory, was from, the, from 1976. Those theories have been repeatedly put forth and generally debunked for the following reasons. Some children in the Paris household suffer, but some do not. Um, you'd think an entire household would be afflicted. More to the point, the girls are hallucinating or at least claiming that they see diabolical canaries at some moments, and at other moments, they're in, perfectly, they're in perfect possession of good health, and nor do they, does their health deteriorate. So strangely, they seem robust from the beginning of these afflictions to the end. And at one point, it will be explained that they do so because the compact with the, 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 the diabolical magic, the diabolical work, um, affects them like a steroid, so they don't get worn down by these tortures. Um, but, it, but nothing has ever entirely explained why they would be not only sometimes afflicted, but also when they are in the grips of this, whatever it is, this force, why they happen to be seeing exactly what they've heard from the pulpit they should be seeing. So you'd think that if you were actually under the influence of some sort of hallucinogenic agent, you'd be talking about you know, turtles or something that wasn't part of your, script, your, your diet, your normal ministerial diet. So nothing really explains it. The lovely thing about those theories is that they absolve everyone of any ill doing. How do you feel about the degree of sincerity and earnest belief that these were really witches by the part of the people who were essentially prosecuting them? Were there politics involved or, or what? There's clearly, in the, in the, and I go into this at great length in the book, there's, there is clearly a, a tapestry of agendas at work here. Um, and among the justices, perhaps most of all, um, again, as I say, the larger mystery is why is the prosecution, why are they so intent on prosecution here? Stoughton, whom you saw, of whom you saw the image, feels himself on a crusade. He feels that he is, um, there is a moral obligation here to cleanse society of these elements, and he does seem to believe that evil is at work. However, there is also every reason at this moment, Massachusetts has been in a state of total political dislocation, and a new government has just been installed in May of 1692, the new governor had been put in place not knowing that there had been a witch, he'd, he'd just come from England, not having heard yet that there was a witchcraft epidemic um, to, to, with which he had to contend. And then cleaning this up speedily is very important, as is proving that this new government has a legitimacy and can enforce order, because the previous couple of years have been anarchic. So there's an, e there's an enormous incentive here not only to prop up this fledgling administration, but for the civic and the religious authorities to remain hand in glove and for no one to dissent um, one from the other. And that may indeed account for, for much of what happens that summer. Did it stop abruptly or gradually? And does, it, does the record show why? That's such a great question. And again, a number of factors. It would be so nice to have a simple answer. A number of factors come into play. Earlier in the year, if you had expressed any doubt 
about the proceedings, if you had expressed doubt about skepticism, skepticism about witchcraft, you generally were rewarded with a witchcraft accusation. By the end of the summer, tentatively and anonymously, various people have begun to express their concerns. And it tells you something about the climate um, of the time that even a, an influential Massachusetts minister had to make those comments um, anonymously and, and by a piece of Sama's dot literature. The, those concerns, the advice of the New York ministers, a very, very poignant jail petition, um, the crushing of a man under stones, which was a particularly gruesome ordeal, would all combine, as did the sheer number of accused people, which was, there weren't prisons in Massachusetts large enough to accommodate this. So there are a number of factors that finally come together. The terror seems to burn itself out, as I fear we are now doing. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.